you'd always make a date for the FA Cup final, you know? So to get to a position where you, you win it and see my dad and go like, oh my God, you know, we've done it. And then when I had the cup in my hand, looking up to him, like, you know, think of the history and the people that have had their hands on it or the, the games that we've watched together and me as a, as a kid and, and him as my dad. And then for me to finally hold it, it was, yeah, it's amazing and emotional and, yeah, and I just got hammered. <laughs> <laughs> when you were a young player, first breaking through, do you remember any specific advice you were given by a fellow pro? Yeah, there was a few technical bits. I always remember uh, at Tottenham, Les Ferdinand was always very, very good to me. So, like, things with Les, like people think Les is like six four. He's probably about six foot, just touching six foot, um, and I was six foot seven and not very good in the air, <laughs> which was not ideal. So Les taught me how to head a football, taught me how to jump, taught me how to get away from defenders, taught me how to uh, be more dominant in the air. Um, and it was, there was no one better. I used to watch Les at QPR and he was, he was brilliant. Is it quite intimidating meeting people? Because you watch Les, you said at QPR yeah, and yeah. stuff. Is it kind of like intimidating to be like, I looked up to you? Um, it is, yeah. I think you've got to get over that. I think uh, so, certainly when I first sort of trained with the first team or was around the players, um, I was a bit anxious and like, oh my god, look, like I was training with David Ginola and Les Ferdinand, people like that, Sol Campbell. Go and tell, can you tell us the story of you being starstruck when you met when you met Ginola for the first time? When I met Ginola, well, I was on Ginola's boots, so I used to clean Ginola's <laughs> boots. Uh, the year that he won the um, Player of the Year, he was off the charts. Yeah. Um, I always remember what Ginola said to me once. I was, I was, we did a finishing session, I'm trying to think it was myself, Chris Armstrong, Stephen Everson, and Ginola. And um, when the ball was getting clipped out there, clipped up back to me, um, I was, I was like, just like kept moving and like kept. I, he was like, he said, whoa, whoa, <laughs> and he just said, why, why, why are you, like, like why are you moving so much? And I was like, I, I, I don't know, I was just getting ready up, just getting my toes like ready for the ball. And he said, no, 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 he said, just relax. And then the, I always remember it, the ball got chipped out, he flicked it up, volleyed it in the top corner. He said, like this. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Why can't I be more like that? <laughs> God, that has to be so on brand. Oh, on mate, the, pony, the little ponytail <laughs> flew the other way and he just smashed it in the top corner. I thought, what a man. Bearing in mind, Liverpool have just won the European Cup in possibly the best final that we've yeah. ever seen, right, in Istanbul. And I was sat there watching that. I remember I was away with England uh, with Joe Cole and um, we were watching it. I just thought it was unbelievable, like incredible. And little did I know, like a few months later, I'd be playing for that team, you know. So I was sitting there, I always remember it. My agent called me and I was at home and he said, are you sitting down? And I was like, yeah, and he said, look, you're Liverpool want you. And I was like, yeah, couldn't, couldn't believe it. I'd had an amazing season at Southampton, but um, I, I just thought Liverpool had the pick of the Europe's best strikers, you know, and um, you know, and, and Rafa had seen something in me that he liked, and uh, I was on my way up there, and then obviously always remember me and my dad, sort of, you know, we're football people, so going round Anfield and looking at the, the history and the, the trophies and the players that have walked in that in that stadium before, just incredible to be a part of it. There was a lot to iron out because I was at Southampton at the time, we'd been relegated and uh, Rupert Lowe was the chairman at the time and he was quite adamant that I'd be staying. Um, and I had to go into pre-season, so I was in, for, I mean, it dragged on for quite a while. Uh, I ended up having to drive down to, to, to Rupert Lowe's house because um, he wasn't answering calls. Uh, and I said, wow. you know what, you want me to play in, in the Champions League? in the Championship or the Champions League next year, you know what I mean? Like, how, if you put yourself in my shoes, and obviously I've got an opportunity to go to Liverpool, and he was like, yeah, but we need you to get back up, you can always go next year, and I was like, look, listen, you know, it might not be, it might not be happening next year. So I was quite adamant, obviously, that I wanted to, wanted to go, but, um, and Harry was obviously my manager at the time, was probably playing both sides. He was saying to me, yeah, you've got to go, absolutely got to, and then saying to Rupert, now we've got to keep him. <laughs> You said before about how that they were the training was a different level at Liverpool, Ooh. where it was like the Steven Gerrard was always on it. Was it incredible to just be in training with players of that level of ability? Yeah, I think um, 
you know, having trained with with England while I was at Southampton, obviously mm. that you know gave me a you know a, a, an inkling into what playing at a top club would be like, you know, day in day out because the standards expected and uh, like I say, it's quite ruthless. So when uh, the ball was wrapped into me by Steven Gerrard, like I'm expected to control it, and if one bounced off you, yeah. you'd get the stare from Steve as if like. What am I dealing with here? You know, <laughs> so you don't want to let you almost didn't want to let Stephen down more more than you didn't want to let Rafa down. So it was intense training um, and to the level you would expect um, from a top club. And outside of Stevie, was there any? Is there who else was there in the squad that you were like, wow, this, that's a player? Defensively at that time, we were we were brilliant. Um, Hoopier and Carragher, mm. centre halves were. It did just you just felt totally confident um, with them there, uh, but yeah, the midfield was was frightening as well. Like with uh, with Alonso, Gerard, later Mascarano, Sissoko, like the central midfield players were were off the charts as well. Um, Steve Finnan was one of the most underrated players I think I've ever played with, uh, and then eventually when Torres came, um, he just he, you know he just blew it away. Well, while we're on Torres there, then like when that, when that happens, when someone arrives, like Torres arrived later on when you've been there for yeah. a year or so, and that, when his first training session, is it kind of like a moment of quoi, he's a player? Um, would you believe me if I said no? no. <laughs> <laughs> um, thing is about Torres, right? like, I, I don't know, we, you have a, probably a preconception of Spanish players yeah. being very sort of technically gifted. Um, he, he, he wasn't really a traditional Spanish player, if, if you know what I mean. So in training, like, I wouldn't say, like, it was, you know, his first touch was brilliant and, like, you know, he was dictating, you know, games and things like that. But come the game, he was so explosive, um, strong, quick, and, and could finish. And he had the ability to sort of, you know, twist people inside out and, um, and finish. And he was so strong and he was quite nasty. Like, you know, it, was, it wasn't something that I expected he would be. Um, obviously, I'd seen him play for Atletico, but when he came, he was something he was different to what I expected. Um, but, but my God, when he when he played that season, it was it was a joke. He was just he was tearing defenses apart. You know, when Torres came in, I was like, yeah, great. You know, got got a top player here. But where am I going to fit into this? And then obviously Torres and Stevie sort of hit it off with an amazing yeah. like understanding. And uh, I was basically the plan B then, which I got totally like. You know, I can't stand there and go, I should be playing ahead of Torres, who's bagged 30 the year before. Yeah. Um, but I, I was in a good good form myself. I think I scored 18 goals the year before. Um, you know, I'd scored a lot of goals in the Champions League. I was playing for England and scoring for fun as well. And I felt like that, you know, him coming, which I totally understand, it sort of, you know, it was halting what I, what I was doing. You know, I couldn't really, I couldn't stand by and let that happen. You know, I had an England place at stake. And I was gutted. Um, Leaving Liverpool because I would have, I would have, I'd like to have been there for the rest of my life, but I just couldn't see a way that I, me and and unless me and Torres played together, which I thought we could have done, but Rafa didn't seem to, you know, in, do that much. Um, so yeah, I felt like I had to move on. It's a shame, really, because I ended up seeing Gog and Voromin up front instead. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps I should have hung around. <laughs> did you have like was, did you have a relationship with Rafa where like? You could go and tell him, like, can I, what, should I, can I start with, should I be playing up top of Torres? Or? Do you know what? No one had a relationship with Rafa like that. Um, I don't think, he didn't enjoy anyone sort of coming to questioning his, some of his decisions. And often, if you said something to him and asked him about his decisions and, you know, what, where can I improve or what can I do, he'd just drop you for three, four games. <laughs> he was very, very cold in, in, that, in those situations, yeah. He'd just be like, you'd never know what he was thinking, ever. I remember Stephen Gerrard uh, quite famously saying that he never got a well done from Rafa. He would always. I remember Stevie running games, coming in afterwards, and Rafa would tell him where he went wrong, um, and you'd be thinking like, you know, it'd always be how you could improve, and never, you know, well done. You played well today. I always remember. I think it was a game at Birmingham City we played. I scored two before half time, and I said to Rafa like, just let me stay on. I want to get a hat trick and all that. He hauled me off in. 54 minutes, or oh, straight off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was I was quite nervy, if I remember rightly. I mean, it, what, the, the final wasn't at, at Wembley; it was in Cardiff. Yeah. So we were uh, we stayed in the hotel, and there was there was things with when we play like 
for Liverpool, like in the Champions League or in an FA Cup final, for instance, you can't get away from Liverpool. They're everywhere, right? They just they're just everywhere. No matter where you are, they'll they'll find you. Um, so I remember being in the hotel. There was loads of fans downstairs. They were singing songs. They were, you know, it was all going. And you so you just you can't really like just pretend it's a, another game. Um, and I was quite nervy because I, I'd grown up with the FA Cup and I, that was my I'd always wanted to win it and I grew up not far from Wembley so I watched a load of finals and um, it was special yeah the fact that I, I found out I was starting I was I really really pleased with um, you know all the you know all the new boots printed up with the the, the the FA Cup final sort of on the boot and stuff like that so they were all lined up it was just you could just feel like it was a bigger game than the normal and then the game was a, a, an incredible match yeah it was amazing you, you, yeah. Had, you were an assist in you from Gerard I point. did yeah and I, yeah, I scored a goal that I've still maintained up until this day <laughs> that was onside um, but having looked you know in the VAR <laughs> era if I had to I think I was off <laughs> <laughs> we'll get the lines out in no, there. He was so close though, and I was like, I, I, you know, it was a, I, would have, I would have loved to have scored the final, obviously, but um, yeah, that was one that got away. But uh, yeah, I remember, I wouldn't really call it an assist, I just nodded one down, and it, Stevie hit one from 35 yards. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 you couldn't miss from there. <laughs> yeah, you could, yeah, it's on the plate. That's what I mean, and then you've got all that, like, so you were in you the subs after about 70 minutes, when I think, in yeah. hand for, for Didi Hamad. Then um, you're watching on the sidelines, watching this game get to... What's the feel? Is it the difference in feeling between being on the pitch and then watching it from the sidelines? What yeah, worse. Miles worse. When you when I got subbed off, it was miles worse. But I remember obviously being down. I remember half-time team talk and we were losing. And uh, I don't know if you remember that. At that time, West Ham and Pardew had all been dancing around, you know, <laughs> or every every game that like when they were winning, they would, they would have a little dance together and all that. And I remember the team talk was like, we just don't want to see these dancing. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, I mean, it roused Stevie. You know? <laughs> no one wants to see Pardew uh, dance. No one wants to see that. <laughs> especially not Stephen by the looks of it. Uh, because I remember he had cramp just before he hit the 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 the, 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 uh, the equaliser. He had cramp and I was on a touch and everyone was going, you know, we need to get him off, we need to get him off. And then it, it, it wasn't long after he was down, he got up and then hit this shot from that far out with cramp. It, you know, it defies, defies logic. But, but that for me, winning the FA Cup and, you know, it wasn't won yet after that strike, but it felt like our name was on the cup, if you know what I mean. Yeah. I mean it's a cliche, but it really did win because we were down and out and, and, you know, he's hit this, it was like one last effort to, to, to shoot from 25 yards. <laughs> and um, yeah, we saw that go in. It was just like, you know, this fella's superhuman. Or was it just like pandemonium on the benches then? Carnage, yeah, absolute carnage. And then it was like, right, calm down. We've got more work to do. <laughs> I mean, the moment we won it, I just think, yeah, it's relief more than anything because because the way the game panned out, we were, the ups and downs of the game, and um, yeah, we just we were just tired. We were emo I was quite emotional. I remember running on the pitch and throwing my jacket around and little things like that, and then seeing my dad and becoming quite emotional about mm. the whole situation because because of the FA Cup meant so much to me and my dad. It was like our thing, you know, like watching. The gate, that was the biggest, you'd always make a date for the FA Cup final, you know, so to get to a position where you, you win it and see my dad and go like, oh my God, you know, we've done it. And then when I had the cup in my hand, looking up to him and like, you know, think of the history and the people that have had their hands on it or the, the games that we've watched together and me as a, as a kid and, and him as my dad. And then for me to finally hold it, it was, yeah, it's amazing and emotional and yeah, and I just got hammered. <laughs> <laughs> great, it was great. a great time. <laughs> you know, one thing that sticks out in my mind um, was the Champions League final in 2007. Um, just not starting that game, like I felt like I'd scored a lot of goals, I'd done well, and then to not be selected for the final was a was a killer personally because obviously I never got the chance to play in the Champions League final again. Yeah. I did come on, you know, but. You know, I felt like that AC Milan team was there for the taking and we, we let them off the hook a bit there. 
Is, is that the hardest loss to take in your career as well, that final? Yeah, I think so, because we, I, th I think we were a good team then. Mm. Um, and we didn't really take the game to them. Um, we played like Dirk Kite up front on his own, five in midfield, and I felt like they were not as good as the 2005 team that got beat. Um, they're still obviously a top side, yeah, but yeah. I just felt that if we'd, if we'd have been more offensive, I think we could have gone and, and beaten them. And uh, like I say, it would have it would have been nice to have a, a Champions League winners medal instead of a runners up one, which I don't even know where it is. <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> Do you keep all your other medals? Yeah, I've got medals and stuff, yeah. All right, the winners really. ones are all kept somewhere. Yeah, I just, I just, I, I, like that one, I don't think I ever looked, I don't think I've looked at it since I, since I lost, since we lost. Really? Not once. Yeah. You played under Sven and, and Steve McLaren and Capello. Is that like, what were their strengths and weaknesses? What were they, who, what were they, and how were they different? Yeah, I mean, chalk and cheese, really, Sven and Fabio. Um, you know, Sven was so relaxed, really, you know, chilled out. Um, that His kind of approach suited me the, the most, I mm. felt, um, because he just let you go out and play and express yourself and say, you were, you know, you're good players, go and basically show, show how good you are. Whereas, yeah, Fabio was, was completely the opposite, you know, in a structure, you stay to this structure, you know, the discipline, uh, much less relaxed, <laughs> let's be honest. Uh, but that was it, that was his style, but uh, like for me personally, that, did, that didn't work for me as much. Um, but McLaren was sort of in between that really, and I, I felt like, you know, I know he gets a bit of a rough ride with with England fans maybe, and uh, but as a as a coach and as a, as a help to me, mm. uh, he was first class, um, I felt, you know, we, we'd known him beforehand anyway because he, he was a terrific coach. He was around the lads. The lads all respected him. Um, and yeah, we had a difficult time because we didn't qualify in 2008 for the Euros. Uh, and he got a hell of a lot of stick, which what England managers do. But um, from inside the camp, everyone had you know, nothing but respect for him. I, I want to talk about Fabio Capello being a disciplinarian. Because I've heard, I've, I've heard Ben Foster all talking about how he had very, he's very strict on yeah. everything. What was that like as a camp? when you were with him for a long time. Well, it was difficult. It was quite funny seeing, seeing sort of st senior players getting told off for the first time. <laughs> like who? Um, Frank Lampard for being on his phone. Um, <laughs> it was like being a naughty, you know, we felt like we were naughty kids again, you know? But I found it quite funny when, you know, like players of the caliber of <laughs> players that were getting told off, it was quite funny. I remember Emil Heskey getting there. He was, um, what did he do again? Oh yeah, he was on his phone in uh, at dinner, and I remember you know when you lift off the, the trays of the buffet, and uh, I remember him just throwing the tray and the noise that it made, like the, these trays of the buffet going down, like, and he said Emil, <laughs> and Em um, um looked up and he was like, we have we have ten minutes to stick together um, with no fire, and you can't do it. And uh, he, he threw them again, and, like, and the noise and it ricocheted all around the room. And um, I always remember that like, I'm just putting it away, like, sorry, Gavin. <laughs> Were you ever ever on the end of a, a um, off from Fabio? Yeah, I remember he, he taught me. You know, I remember he came to to a game um, in, into Milan. We played at White Hart Lane. Uh, and he never really he never really me, but he. Uh, I remember, he, he, I felt like I was good at volleys. I remember him telling me, like, he came in after five minutes and told me that my volume technique was wrong. And uh, I, said, I said, I'll be honest, I know that, he, that he's an absolute legend. I've got a lot of respect for you, but I've been volleying like this all my life and I'm not gonna change it now. Um, and yeah, he was a bit taken back by that. But um, yeah, I always remember that sort of one. Uh, and also, yeah, he completely mugged me off for the, um, for the South Africa World Cup 2010. Gave me the number nine and gave me about five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I got the squad number, I, thought, I remember, always remember thinking, oh my God, I've got the number nine for the World Cup. This is, I'm playing. I didn't play it at all. I think representing my country like every time, it was never lost on me really. It was never lost on me um, every time you played and I think Scoring my first goal was, I played, I was at Liverpool at the time and it was at Anfield against Uruguay, that was my first goal. Um, there were some good moments obviously, the, 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 the robot was a load of fun, um, scoring against Hungary the first time. 
Uh, but I don't think you'll ever be representing your country in a World Cup. Yeah. Uh, that first game against Paraguay uh, in Germany, I always remember being, uh, you know, the number nine for for England that day. Um, it was never lost on me because you know I remember my dad saying to me, you know, think of how many kids play football, think of how many kids want to play for England, think of how many kids want to play out front for England in a World Cup. And at this particular day, that's you. You know what I mean? Like, it is an amazing thing yeah. that you know. Sometimes you, I think, after your career, you realise like, oh yeah, that was not bad. It gives you a goosebumps that even yeah. just like pulling the shirt on, yeah, singing, yeah. singing the anthem. Yeah, amazing. You know, singing the, the anthem in the World Cup, knowing, thinking the whole nation has stopped to watch this particular match that you're involved in. Um, yeah, it, I mean, that was probably the the best feeling. Um, representing country yeah. and then you scored against Trinidad yeah that again as well like yeah scoring a goal against in a World Cup as well um, it just things just just you don't realise the magnitude and listen I've scored headers loads of times right yeah. and I just that's all it was you know I remember obviously Beckham great cross me, me heading it in bit of relief because we should have been beating Trinidad anyway yeah. let's be honest um, <laughs> and scoring and then Obviously, the elation of scoring, but then the realization afterwards is like of how many. When you see the, you know, the fan yeah. parks and people with yeah. beers up in the air, and you realize that you've, you know, done that. Um, yeah, that's special. I think you left out about that goal. You had your hand on the guy's ponytail. I did. I really did. Yeah. <laughs> I, they asked me after the game about it. I said, "What about the foul?" And I was like, "What are you talking about? I had no, no foul there." And then I went home and I sat in my hotel room and I saw the goal. And I was like, "Ooh." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was, that was bad. I, I, but I, li I literally had no recollection of pulling his dreadlocks. But I, like, I literally jumped up and just like I was trying to get leverage. I didn't know if it was his shirt or anything. I didn't know anyone saw it or anything. And I just obviously just grabbed something and pulled, and he beat his whole neck back. And yeah, obviously it was a foul, but it's okay. in the record books now. Yeah. <laughs> There's no one in our team thinking score a winning goal. No one can be. Yeah. You know, you just scored a goal. Your relief is is enormous. And then the second goal goes in, and literally I'm planked on the floor on my back. Literally, I think I actually nearly went into tears. I was emotional, I was screaming, and to be fair, even now I feel quite emotional about it.